Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Surya. Surya uh, was, I guess, my one of my advisors for my PhD as well. Uh, he's a professor at Stanford University in applied physics, um, and he will be talking about um, what, what's the title? Some random stuff. <laughs> Some random stuff. Yes. Thanks. Uh. We'll see. I should be okay. Okay, thanks. So um, I wanted to uh, talk about um, glimpses towards a new science of brains, mind, minds, and machines, basically weaving together physics, computation, and neurobiology. And I'd like to start by noting one of the greatest ironies of human existence. Uh, easy start. Uh, at least that small part of human existence that intersects with NIPS. And that is that neural circuits evolve to exploit the laws of physics, to compute, but in ways that are fundamentally different from that of the computers that they themselves designed, right? So they work at very disparate timescales. Uh, our neural circuits are very slow. They operate in the millisecond timescale, whereas computers, computers have nanosecond clock speeds. They're remarkably energy efficient. They operate at 20 watts, so we're all dimmer than light bulbs, literally. Uh, supercomputers operate at megawatt ranges. So they, they're faster, they're, they take up more energy, Yet their performance on the types of tasks we're interested in NIPS at high-level AI is relatively abysmal um, compared to, to neural circuits in humans. Um, they have some other major differences that are probably explanatory of, the, of this difference in performance. So com the computational paths, the intermediate computational paths that neural circuits take are highly variable and analog, whereas uh, computers are highly precise. They, they flip bits in very precise ways from the beginning to the end of the computation in a digital way. Information encoding in neural circuits is high dimensional and distributed. Uh, information in computers are, are placed in precisely localized registers. You know where every piece of information goes uh, um, in the computer. Uh, so these are very, very different me methods of computation. And so in order to, to bridge this gap, what we're really going to need is a new science of minds, brains, and machines that seamlessly weaves together physics, neurobiology, and computation to extract conceptual insight into how our neural circuits compute and instantiate those conceptual insights in artificial circuits. Uh, I will not offer that to you today. I can't. This is going to be a collective endeavor that will occupy all of us for many, many years to come. But our lab does work at the intersection of physics, computation, and neurobiology. And we have several vignettes that we'd like to share with you uh, uh, today. So, so one of the things that we're, um, you know, two, two of the main ways that we both model cognition and model structure in the natural world are neural networks and probabilistic generative models. And you know, to understand how neural networks compute, we'd love to have a unification of these two very disparate methods of modeling. And we've started along those pathways in terms of understanding the developmental emergence of, say, probabilistic hierarchical structure in both infants and machines. The other uh, aspect of neural systems is they operate using very, very high dimensional representations. And there's lots of interesting mathematics operating in high dimensional spaces, non-intuitive mathematics. And it's likely that the secrets of high dimensional spaces are incredibly important for understanding neural computation. And so we have some results in exploiting the geometry of high dimensional error surfaces to speed up neural network learning. Also, equilibrium statistical mechanics has had a huge impact on machine learning. You can just list the names, right? Helmholtz machine, Boltzmann machine, cavity method, mean field theory, beta free energy. There's a huge interplay between machine learning and, and equilibrium stat mech. But non-equilibrium stat mech, which is the stuff of dynamics and the stuff of life, has not had as much of an impact on machine learning. 
Uh, but I believe the time is ripe for non-equilibrium system mechanics to start to play a role, and we have some results there that we'll, that we'll discuss. Uh, and also, we don't often have uh, broad theories that simultaneously consider trade-offs between three very important physical co quantities in computation, energy, speed, and accuracy. And we have uh, recently elucidated some fundamental limits on the accuracy of communication, given constraints on energy and time, that serve as a benchmark for what we can hope to achieve both in biology and in machine. Uh, so this is a lot to cover, and I'll just give you uh, highlights here, but fortunately, Almost everything I'm going to talk about is published. These are the results. And actually, Andrew and I gave back-to-back -back talks because uh, we worked together on a lot of the same things. Uh, and so the first part of the uh, uh, work will be with Andrew and Jay McClelland. Uh, the, the second part will be a collaboration with Yashio Bengio's lab. Uh, the third part will be, was led by an excellent postdoc in my lab, now at Google Brain Research, Joshua Soldikstein. And the final part of the talk was led by uh, Shubhani Lahiri, another excellent postdoc in my lab. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank my funding sources. So, so let's begin. Let's begin with uh, um, understanding the developmental emergence of probabilistic hierarchical structure in infants and machines. Uh, so this is, again, the work with Andrew Sachs and Jay McClelland. So here's a basic observation about the development of infant categorical knowledge. Okay. So even when you control for the perceptual similarity of objects, uh, infants tend to learn coarse-grained categorical distinctions uh, much earlier in developmental time than they learn finer scale categor finer grained categorical distinctions. They can probe what categories infants can discriminate through looking time studies at, say, age six months before they can talk. And there's actually a whole host of other phenomena here that, that we, we've also analyzed, but for this talk I'm going to focus on the development of categorical structure. Okay? And there's a fantastic review of, of all of this phenomena uh, in this book by Rogers and McClellan called Semantic Cognition. So in this book uh, and, and in previous papers, uh, Jay McClelland and company tried to simulate this process in neural networks. Why do you get this progressive differentiation of hierarchical structure in human categorical knowledge? So what they did was they did a very simple simulation with an artificial toy data set where you had a bunch of uh, animals and plants and fish and so on. And that fed into some common representation layer and a hidden layer. And you can ask the network various queries. And the system has various properties that are properties of the objects in the real world. And they just trained the network through backpropagation. And they, did, they looked at the dynamics of learning in the internal representation. Right? So each of these objects uh, um, have orthogonal representations in the input. But they will develop correlated representations in the, in the hidden layer. And they just by visualizing th these hidden representations as they develop over developmental time of the network, they found that the network behaved a lot like infants. So initially, the weights are random, so the representations are random. Then suddenly, you can discriminate between um, animals and plants, the most coarse grained distinction, then different types of uh, plants, different types of animals, and so on. And this is a multi-dimensional scaling plot of the uh, representations in the hidden layer. And again, you see this progressive differentiation of hierarchical structure. So when I first thought, saw this, as I was at once excited and confused. Excited because, wow, these neural networks behave like infants, and confused as to why. I mean, these are much simpler objects than infants. So there must be theoretical principles at play that guide this dynamics. What are they? Uh, so this is when Andrew and I started thinking about these linear networks. And um, oh, sorry, and I should note that these, these kinds of hierarchical representations are also seen both in human and monkey, and they actually align. Uh, this is famous work by Cris Corte and, and company. So the question is, how does it get there? What's the dynamics of getting there? So you know, we made the bold assumption that maybe a, a linear network could also uh, exhibit this, right? Because the learning dynamics of linear networks are nonlinear. Uh, these are the learning dynamics of batch grainy descent at slow learning rates. You get a set of horribly complicated nonlinear differential equations. We solve them. And as Andrew told you in the last talk, uh, what, what the system is doing is it's slowly building up the singular value decomposition of the input-output correlation matrix of your data, uh, but mode by mode, where statistical modes or singular values that are large are learned on a shorter time scale. And the time scale of learning is 1 over the singular value. So this is intuitively uh, appealing. Stronger statistical structure is learned first. OK, um, okay but what does, all of, what does any of this have to do with hierarchy? Okay. So the problem with well, one of the issues with this work is they were working with a toy data set. What we'd like is a more controlled data set over which, over which we have analytical control. And so the way that we approached this was to describe the world as some kind of hierarchical generative model 
draw data from that generative model, statistical model, feed that data to a neural network, and try to understand how the statistical structure of the generative model imprints, imprints itself onto the learning dynamics of the network. I think this is one route for research to go as we go forward, make the generative models more complex and the networks more complex, and really try to understand what's going on. Uh, so this is sort of a first step. Uh, so what was our generative model? Well, we essentially mimicked the process of evolution. We had a, a branching diffusion process where individual properties or features of objects, for example, can or cannot fly, would diffuse down the tree, and each time it diffused, it has a probability of changing. And that, that, that feature gets assigned to each of these objects, and your different features get assigned independently through different branching diffusions through this tree. So at the end of the day, you get a statistical structure where items that are closer together in the tree or have a more common recent ancestor are more similar to each other. And this is sort of a classical uh, description of hierarchically structured data. Okay, so now we know that the learning dynamics of, of these linear networks are sensitive only to the second order statistics of this data, i.e. the correlation matrix or the, or, or the uh, correlation, uh, yeah, so basically the singular value decomposition of that correlation matrix. So to understand how hierarchical structure is learned in this simple network, we just have to understand the singular value decomposition of data sets generated in this way. We can analytically compute the singular value decomposition and we find a remarkably simple structure the singular vectors, which one set of singular vectors can be thought of as functions on the leaves of the tree, these singular vectors respect the hierarchical structure of the tree, where the strongest singular vector is the constant function. The next strongest singular vector with second largest singular value is a low frequency function that's constant on this branch and the opposite value but constant on this branch. So it makes a, the most broadest scale categorical distinction. And then the next strongest singular vectors make distinctions within the branch and then finally, the weakest one makes distinctions within individual uh, branches, right? So this is how the singular value structure of hierarchically structured data behaves. And, and this is a match between our analytical expressions and the simulation. And so when you put it all together, you get a theorem. Essentially, any network must exhibit progressive differentiation on any data set generated by this class of hierarchical diffusion processes that mimic evolution. Essentially, the idea is network learns input-output modes in a time one over their singular value. Singular values of broader hierarchical distinctions are larger than those of, of finer distinctions. And these input-output modes or singular vectors correspond exactly to the hierarchical distinctions of the tree. So then you, you essentially get the result. And so when you put it all together, we can analytically compute the multidimensional scaling plots that we'd expect from these linear networks. And this is what we get. We just arbitrarily labeled the leaves you know, according to just labels. And so now when you compare the very, very complicated, hard to understand simulations of nonlinear networks with the exact mathematical analysis of the linear networks, you see a remarkable qualitative match. And so this is the difference really between simulation here and theory here. We have much more conceptual insight into the origin of this hierarchical progressive differentiation of structure in these nonlinear networks through rigorous analysis of a simple theory in the spirit of what Andrew was, uh, was arguing for. Um, rem a remarkable surprise of this is that the second order statistics of these semantic features are powerful and sufficient enough to drive this hierarchical differentiation. That was an interesting surprise. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of other psychological effects that we can analytically analyze and, 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 and conceptually explain in terms of previous simulations, but we don't have time to talk about that. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next part. Uh, you know, we need to understand the mathematics of high dimensional spaces. And so Andrew also alluded to this in his previous talk. Uh, so one of, the, w one of the, the intuitions that we have about say error surfaces over high dimensional spaces is that they, they're riddled with local minima, right? In fact, it's often thought that local minima at high error stand as the major impediment to non-convex optimization. However, this is only true sort of in low dimensional landscapes. This is, for example, a caricature of a protein folding landscape. And it, it is indeed riddled with local minima. And uh, that's true because it's low dimensional. But we know that our intuition derived from moving within a three dimensional world, our intuition about geometry there, is woefully inadequate for generalizing to our intuitions about geometry in, in, in high dimensions. And in high dimensions, things are very, very different. In basically typical ran random non-convex error surfaces, local minima at high error are exponentially rare in the dimensionality. Instead, saddle points proliferate. And we basically developed an algorithm that rapidly escapes these saddle points and speeds up neural network training. 
So this was work that was done in collaboration with some excellent graduate students and with Yashio Bengio. Okay. So the idea is, again, we, we exploit some results that in statistical physics where they look at the geometry of high dimensional landscapes. And, and the basic idea is, let's say you have a, a, an error landscape over a million variables, right? And let's say you, you reach a critical point, the slope vanishes somewhere. What are the chances that it's a local minimum? Will all million directions of the function have to curve up? That's going to be exponentially unlikely unless you're already near the bottom, all right? So you can make this much more precise. For each critical point, you can plot each critical point in a two-dimensional feature space. One axis is the error level of the critical point. The other axis is the fraction of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. And um, uh, basically, you might think that critical points a priori live anywhere in this two-dimensional space. But it turns out they don't. They concentrate on a monotonically increasing curve. This was a calculation done by statistical physicists back in 2007. They concentrate on a monotonically increasing curve. The global minimum is here. The global maximum is here. But critical points as you move up the energy ladder develop more and more negative curvature directions until you're at the total top where in which all directions are negative. So basically, at intermediate levels of energy, you have no local minima. You only have saddle points. Okay. Now, physicists would then say, ah, oh, this is kind of a universal result. You know, it should be true for anything. Of course, computer scientists will fight back and say, no, your analysis on random landscapes is not relevant. We're doing special stuff on neural networks whose error landscapes over synaptic weights are very, very different than your random landscapes. In physics, we're used to the notion of universality where there exists at least some questions whose answers don't depend on the details. Uh, but in computer science, we're not as used to that. Uh, so I predicted that this would happen in, in neural networks, so I teamed up with Yashua to test this. And they tested it, and lo and behold, that's exactly what they found. So in deep neural networks trained on MNIST and CIFAR-10, they found that the critical points concentrated on a monotonically increasing curve in exactly the predicted two-dimensional feature space. Okay, now what can we do, do about this? Uh, so it turns out that Newton's method is attracted to critical points of any index. It's attracted to saddle points. But you can cure this problem by instead of dividing by the Hessian in Newton's method, dividing by the absolute value of the Hessian, and by that I mean take the Hessian, compute all its eigenvalues, and replace the, each one of them with their absolute value. It turns out that that dynamics, this dynamics, is rapidly repelled from saddle points, and you can justify it theoretically using trust region methods as well. And it works remarkably well. So here's deep neural network training, uh, where you just start off with stochastic gradient descent, and you see that you get these plateaus in learning performance as a function of time. When you see a plateau, you might think, oh my gosh, I'm stuck in a local minimum. But actually, when you switch to this new algorithm, which we call Saddle Free Newton, you suddenly drop an error. Okay? So, so this, this algorithm can actually do something by exploiting our knowledge about the geometry of high dimensional spaces. I should say Jan LeCun also has a different method for arriving at the same conclusion that saddle points proliferate in high dimensions. All right, so now let's move from equilibrium to non-equilibrium uh, stat mech. So that's this part. So there's been a lot of advances in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics recently that are really very exciting. Essentially, you can show that the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy increases, emerges through Jensen's inequality as a corollary of some equality known as the Jarzinski equality. It's quite remarkable that the Jensen's inequality is what leads to the second law of thermodynamics from a much more fundamental law. Uh, if you want to look it up, you just Google Jarzinski equality and you'll, you'll get to that literature. But what this means, oh, sorry, so, so this is work that was uh, uh, done with my postdoc, Joshua, who's now uh, working at the Google Brain. He just left my lab recently. Um, so, so basically, what this is saying is we're used to the idea of things becoming disordered over time. That's the second law. But transiently, for small systems and for short times, things can, the entropy can transiently decrease which means you can spontaneously create order from noise, okay? So motivated by these ideas, we, we, um, we're going to try to help this process along by using neural networks, okay? So the basic idea, and, and, and use neural networks to learn uh, very, very deep generative models of complex structured probability distributions. So here's the physical motivation. Let's say you have a complicated data distribution that you don't have analytical control over, and you'd like to learn a probabilistic model for that data distribution. The basic idea is destroy structure in data through a diffusive process. 
carefully record that destruction of structure as a movie, frame by frame movie, and then use a deep neural network to reverse time to create structure from noise. Let's not let the laws of diffusive physics do it for us uh, itself, but let's, let's replace the laws of diffusive physics with a neural network to help this process along. And again, this was inspired by recent uh, results in non-equivalent system mechanics, which show that entropy can transiently decrease for short time scales. Okay, so that, you know, just to put it pictorially, let's, let's say this physical die distribution is a complicated data distribution. We can't write down a formula for it or immediately train a neural network to sample from it. Instead, what we do is we let the die diffuse, and it will then become a simple distribution, uniform if you diffuse for long enough. And then we train a neural network to start from the uniform distribution and go backwards in time and rekey at the data distribution. And so then you get a generative model. Okay? So now, if this is going to work, so let me now demonstrate that this sort of audacious idea works. So. Um, Here's the basic idea. So this is a classical toy model in machine learning, the Swiss roll. And what's the diffusive process look like? Well, we just let each data point diffuse with a restoring force to the origin. So the stationary distribution is an isotropic Gaussian. And this is the diffusion process. Okay. And then what we do is we carefully record this movie and we train a neural network where each layer in the neural network just has to go one step back in time and, and reproduce what happened in the past given the present. And we do this over many, many layers and train it to do that. If it works, we should be able to sample from the Swiss roll in a very simple way. We sample from an isotropic Gaussian in two dimensions. That's the only stochastic step. And then we feed it through the neural network, which could be a deterministic step, or you could also have noise in the neural network. So if it works, I should be able to take a new Gaussian point cloud, feed all the data points through the neural network, and reconstruct the Swiss roll from noise. And that's what happens. So it sort of works. I mean, it works pretty well. There's some straggler data points out here. What the system effectively learns is it learns a transient vector field that takes points everywhere and concentrates it on the Swiss roll. Okay. So now we can, um, so we can now move up the level of complexity. So the next level of complexity is a toy model of natural images, say the dead leaves model, where you throw down uh, circles of different radii. And uh, the, the, the radii have a power law, power law radius distribution to mimic the scale-free nature of natural images. The, the circles occlude each other to mimic occlusion. So you get all sorts of interesting uh, structure that mimics the structure of natural images. Um, so this is, this is a, this is a uh, uh, sorry, I should probably make this. Uh, it's okay, I'm gonna go back to the movies. So this is a, this is a sample of the dead leaf, of the dead leaf model. Um, so this is a sample of the dead leaf model. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is a sample of the dead leaf model. This is a sample for the next best probabilistic model of dead leaves that's out there. And then I'll show you how our model works. So the basic idea is we, we train the model in a bunch of dead leaves. We have the pixels undergo diffusion, so we have a diffusive process that turns dead leaves into white noise. We train your very, very deep neural networks with a thousand layers to reverse this process. And at the end of the day, if it works, you should be able to turn white noise, feed it into the neural network, and generate dead leaves. Okay, so this is an example of that uh, working. So as you can see, it gets a, a lot of the structure, and in fact, it gets simultaneously things that are hard to get in natural images. It gets sharp edges, as well as long-range uniform regions, and also long-range angular correlations in the edge. Right? So getting all three of those simultaneously can be difficult. Okay, the other thing we can do is we can train it on, um, train it, we, we can sample from the posterior distribution over images. So what we can do, for example, is train it on textures and then um, you know, m maybe replace the interior of a texture with white noise but clamp the pixels in the boundary. So the neural network for, for these images operates in a convolutional fashion. So then information from the boundary should be able to propagate into the interior and fill in the image. So this is an example um, uh, of Bark. So what we do is we just take this initial image and feed it into the neural network. And the neural network um, fills in its best guess as to what was in the interior. And as you can see, it, do, it, does, it does a decent job. Uh, it gets these long-range correlations and edges, especially, and also the homogeneous regions. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, 
So let's go back. So I should say that, um, oh no, that's not what I wanted, sorry. In case you missed any of the talk, you, it's a quick review. Um, yeah, so I should say that for the dead leaves model, we achieve, to our knowledge, state-of-the-art performance as far as probabilistic models of dead leaves go in terms of log likelihood on the data. Um, that's the bar. Okay, so there's a couple of key ideas in here. There's actually two key ideas that I wanted to, to summarize. Is that we circumvent simultaneously two problems that vex machine learning. One is the credit assignment problem. How do you assign credit or blame to neurons that are far removed from the final output? Okay, and we circumvent that by providing training targets to every layer. Each layer only needs to go one step back in time, so there's no backpropagation needed. There's no credit assignment problem. The second problem in, in, stochastic, in, in learning generative models is oftentimes when you try to model a distribution, you try to model it as the stationary distribution of some stochastic process. This inevitably has mixing time problems because if your stationary distribution has multiple modes, then it can take exponentially long amounts of time to jump over free energy barriers that separate the modes. So that's the mixing time problem. We circumvent that problem by demanding that the neural network get from a simple distribution to the complicated distribution in finite time. So we are not modeling the data distribution as a stationary distribution, but as the outcome of a transient non-equilibrium stochastic process. I think these two ideas will generalize in all sorts of interesting ways, both to understanding potentially neural computation and augmenting machine computation. Okay, now the final thing, right, there's this huge order of magnitude gap between energy uh, and speed in, in, in uh, machines and neurons. So this begs the question, what are the fundamental limits of energy, speed, and accuracy in, in computation? Uh, so computation is very general, but we worked on communication, and we came up with some interesting limits there. So this is joint work with my postdoc, Shubhanil Lahiri. He's a man after my own heart. He was a string theorist at Harvard. I was also a string theorist, and we both switched into neuroscience. He's actually on the job market this year, so I, I you know, I just thought I'd let you know. Um, okay, so hasn't this already been solved by information theory? And the answer is no. So information theory is very good on placing limits on the accuracy of communication given energy constraints but not time constraints. So if you revisit Shannon's, Shannon's channel coding theorem, it, it gives you bounds on bit rate in terms of energy constrained channel capacity, but oftentimes achieving some bounds could require very, very large block lengths. You take your messages, you put them into a big block, and you tr code that block and you transmit it. But time is of the essence in biology. Biological systems do not have the luxury of coding things into blocks because by the time they build up the block, they might get eaten, all right? So, so it doesn't, inf classical information theory doesn't deal well with the delays. Another interesting subject is the thermodynamics of computation where they asked what's the minimal energy needed to achieve a computation. And they actually showed remarkably that you could achieve some computations with zero energy dissipation. But the catch is it requires infinite time. What was the basic idea? Is that they, they elucidated the fact that en the energy cost of computation occurs mostly in erasing bits. If you erase a bit, you reduce the entropy of your computational device. You must dump that entropy into the outside world because the full system must en uh, uh, increase entropy. If you dump entropy to the outside world, you dump heat to the outside world, you dissipate energy. That's the basic idea. So you could avoid this by making computation reversible, arranging computation so you never have to erase bits. But then if there's no thermodynamic driving force pushing the computation forwards as opposed to backwards, the computation could take infinite time. So, so th there's no really good theory that simultaneously addresses speed, accuracy, and energy. Okay, so we have a theory uh, now that we've come up with recently. And the theory is basically the following. Uh, imagine that you have some external signal, lambda, that you'd like to transmit through, an, through a circuit, any circuit. Um, we model the circuit, we achieve generality by modeling the circuit as any arbitrary stochastic dynamical system. And we need some parameter of that dynamical system, and that parameter is tau, its fastest time scale. Okay? This could be an arbitrary Markovian stochastic dynamical system, and the external signal couples to the Markovian dynamical system by arbitrarily modifying its rates. And now let's say you have a, a signal receiver that can observe the states of the system, and from observing these states, it can reconstruct the input. Okay? The basic framework of communication. Um, okay, so we can, we can 
quantify speed, energy, and accuracy. So we can quantify speed as the speed with which the external signal changes. This is how much the signal changes in one time constant of the, of the signaling system squared. Okay, we can quantify, so by the way, this is a physical system, so it's coupled to a thermal heat bath. We can quantify energy dissipation by the amount of power consumed times the time, so this is how much energy it dissipates within one time constant of the signaling system in units of thermal energy, right? So this is energy. And then accuracy is the inverse variance of your estimator. So we can consider any arbitrary unbiased estimator, and accuracy we just define to be inverse variance. If you define these quantities this way, you can prove a very simple theorem. The product of speed and accuracy is less than or equal to energy, right? So if for a given accuracy, you want to code a faster changing world, you better spend more energy. If for a given speed, given speed at which the world changes, you want to be more accurate, you better spend more energy. What are the proof ideas behind this? Well, there is some work, recent work in non-equivalent system mechanics, which shows that energy dissipation can be quantified through a thermodynamic friction tensor on a manifold of Boltzmann distributions associated with equilibrium distributions of the signaling system. This is, this is done by Gavin Crookes. What we did was we lower bounded this friction tensor by the Fisher information, which is naturally a metric on a manifold of distributions. So it has the same properties as this thermodynamic friction tensor. And then of course, we all know that from for, uh, Fisher information upper bounds accuracy through the Kramer-Rau bound, and by putting it all together, you know, there's a lot of work involved, you get this very simple theorem if you define things this way. Okay, so now this opens the path towards connecting to experiments. Now we can ask, well, how efficient are biological systems subject to these limits? Uh, and also, how far are artificial systems from these limits and what do we need to get there? Okay, so we also, I, you know, I talk, we also do a whole lot of work in my lab where we work very, very closely with neurophysiologists. I haven't talked uh, anything about that work, but we actually make lots of experimentally testable predictions. We work closely with, with neurophysiologists in Stanford to test these predictions. So we're doing, a, um, you know, we're having a lot of fun, and actually I'm looking for postdocs. Uh, my postdocs are looking for jobs, and I'm looking for postdocs, so, so hopefully I'll get postdoc before my postdoc gets a job. But uh, anyway, so, so I, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and again, this is mostly all published work, uh, except for the speed energy accuracy, which is in preparation. I'd like to thank my funding sources. Uh, my website is a little out of date, but hopefully you can find most of these papers on the website. If not, just Google it. Thanks. I think, uh, thanks for the talk, Surya. I just before asking my question, I want to comment that I have a paper with Terry Sanofsky on uh, basically similar idea of using density estimation in uh, uh, learning a stochastic process. So I think it's very, very exciting. Actually, it's my oh, favorite. Cool. Your, e paper e was, your paper was my favorite paper last year. It was like, oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so email me your paper. It'd be yeah, fun to sure. Talk about the that. paper yeah. is called The Wilson Machine. We called it The Wilson Machine. Oh, uh, yes. But Terry mentioned it. Yeah, I remember now. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, Basically, my question is that the things I've also been dealing with in this uh, way of thinking about the problem, you are, it may be a very powerful model for density estimation, but it, if, if you, it's probably not useful for learning representations. Have you thought about that? So basically, if you, if you make this process like quasi-static, let's assume take infinite uh, time. Yeah. It's, I mean, the process go, going from one frame to next frame is going to be very easy, right? Exactly, yeah. And so basically at the end of the day, you may have a very powerful engine for, you know, generative model, but basically yeah. you're not learning anything. I yeah, mean, I my, in my I, model, yeah. I only have uh, center surround filters, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I sympathize with that. Uh, regardless, we looked at the internal representations of these thousand layer networks. And the first few layers were Gabor's, right? I mean, it's, everybody gets Gabor's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't fully understand the representations later on. But I agree with you, if you have an upper bound on depth, then that forces a lot of parsimony in the representation. Yeah, it has yeah. to create very intelligent representations to get from where you are to where you want to go in a finite number of steps. If where you want to go is extremely complicated, why not just take a very, very many steps but have an intelligent uh, teaching procedure? But I mean, you agree that the representation become more powerful if you have infinitely more steps. I mean, the, the learning becomes... Um, don't you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. so we yeah. can prove then, that in the quasi-static limit, yeah, yeah, exactly. where the diffusion is slow and the number of depths go to infinity, yeah. this process will converge to the true distribution of the data. We have a proof of that. Exactly, I understand that. But in that process, 
uh, the representation become uh, more yeah. and more boring, right? We make no, we make no um, claims about the intermediate representation, I see. except yeah. that the final representation is the data distribution. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Hi, um, your dead leaves uh, yeah. generator was very interesting. I liked it a lot. I'm wondering, though, how you measured the, uh, uh, the, the training data probability or test data probability under this generative model um, at the end. It's, oh, it's yeah. a generative model, I and mean, it's not an energy-based model. How do you measure that probability? Yeah, we use basically similar ideas to the Jarzinski inequality where you can use non-equilibrium paths to measure free energy differences. So, so this is one of the interesting uses of the Jarzinski equality is that you can actually measure free energy differences between two states by looking at non-equilibrium paths and averaging over them. And that's what we do. And the free energy difference is a log probability difference. So, so that's how we do it. It's a bit complicated. It's hard to explain immediately. But there's a way to do it. Uh, what we do is we average over multiple paths through the network that, yield, that get to the same data point. That's what we do. Multiple paths through the network to get the same output? Yeah. H how could you get? We diffuse, we diffuse back to the beginning and then go through the network back, essentially. Ah, you use the diffusion process. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So let me ask the question I wanted to ask Andrew before. Um, it's about the first part of your talk. Uh, so you're, you're looking at um, infant learning and um, trying to model that with, with these networks somehow. The brain probably doesn't actually use gradient descent, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you think that would affect, uh, impact your results? So the brain must have some way of solving the credit assignment problem, right? It must. Backpropagation is the only way we know how to solve the credit assignment problem, and this is probably the biggest open problem, in, I think, in, in neuroscience, is how does the brain solve the credit assignment problem? Uh, the best I can say is that any method that, that might solve the credit assignment problem might have learning dynamics that's similar to backprop, but that's a wild speculation. So it's actually quite remarkable that backprop's learning dynamics mimics that. But, but at the end of the day, it's not, it's not that remarkable, right? Because in, in this simple data set, the SVD controls the learning, controls the structure of the data. And so you, you might imagine that almost any sensible learning algorithm would pick up on the larger singular modes first, right? It's just the second order statistics, right? So, so yeah, I, I don't know. That's a kind of a muddled answer, but it's either speculative or trivial. All right. Yeah. Just a, a quick question about units so you can guess this is Yeah, uh, hi, Paul. <laughs> um, I, I was very intrigued. I, I guess that's the one. I was just curious, uh, you know, about the uh, speed accuracy yeah, and energy so, because yeah. of the units of energy. So your energy there is again some so kind of log both of probabilities. Sides, both sides are dimensionless, right. right? If you look at it, so energy is div dimensionless because I normalize power times time by kT. Okay, so speed is dimensionless in time, but has units of lambda squared. Accuracy has units of one over lambda squared. So the product is dimensionless. So the units do work out. As a physicist, I was also very worried about units. Okay. I, I'm totally sympathized with you. In fact, dimensional analysis was a clue for us to guess what the answer would be before we could prove it. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but the diffusion process, so this was for a single image, or how does it generalize? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, so it's trained on an ensemble of images, right? So it learns the distribution. And then you can do all sorts of things, right? You can, you can actually do all sorts of things. You can sample from the distribution. You can infer by clamping parts of the image and infer, and infer the rest. And you can evaluate log probabilities. That was the answer to Timon's question. So, so you can do all of that, but you train on an ensemble, so it doesn't overtrain to one image. Yeah. OK, um, one last question. OK, this is a question related to the previous discussion about the backpropagation being the only known way of doing credit assignment. Um, that kind of raises analogies, like we know how we solve SVD or matrix factorizations or sequence of them, well, expectation maximization or alternating minimization. So maybe uh, it's not necessarily has to be backpropagation. And there is obviously a yeah, relationship. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be, but, but that's, um, I mean, EM is like an alternating minimization over two sets of variables, right? Yeah, or it so could be multiple sets of variables. Yeah, right? it could be multiple it sets have of variables. To be single layer. But the fundamental, I mean, unless you can exactly do the minimization, which justifies many EM algorithms, 
in either in the in the uh, M step, you're going to have to do gradient descent at some point, right? So gradient descent will be a computational primitive in very very complicated problems, right? Where the M step can't be done analytically. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> a dream is that that maybe objective function minimization is not the right principle for understanding brain dynamics at the level of neural dynamics of learning. That, that's a scary proposition, because in machine learning, we always think about objective function minimization. We have nothing else to hold on to there. But we know that oscillators don't minimize any, there's no Lyapunov yeah. function for an oscillating system, and the brain oscillates. So, you know, <laughs> we have to be very careful about the assumptions we make. Um, All right, uh, let's thank Surya again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.